how conservatives co-opt the Christianity? Wait, what the fuck? This episode Portugal is made possible. Whoa, what is this? ...by Brilliant. Be among the first 200 to sign up using the link below and get 20% off your annual premium subscription. I have, I, oh, this is going to be an interesting second thought video. Usually I can just like tell you, like I can pre-watch it. You know what I mean? Because second thought and I agree on a lot of stuff. So like, this is one of those videos where I actually don't know. I actually don't know where he's going to go with this. And this is exciting. Actually didn't pre-watch Puggo. Man, y'all are fucking... Shut up, chatters. Okay? Shut up. I'm sick and tired of you, okay? I'm sick and motherfucking tired of you, chatters. That's right. That's right. Look at my face. Well, quick ass outfit change, bro. How the fuck did he do that? Love you too. I don't get it. Like, how the fuck did he just do that, bro? That's crazy. How is he talking without his mouth moving? The fuck? The fuck? The Vinky? 14 months of getting me right. Conservatives are Christian. Christians are conservative. At least that's probably what you and millions of Americans instinctively think when religion and politics come up together. To be fair, when people think of Christianity and politics in America, it's usually because of the Republican Party. Topics like abortion, LGBTQ rights, and religion in public spaces are key battlegrounds for Republicans and are almost always top issues for Christian voters. For years, the Republican Party has worked very hard to make sure that when you think of a controversial religious topic, they are the party on the Christian side. But why is that the case? In this episode, we'll explore the origins of the link between conservatism and Christianity and consider how religion can be used in a more positive, progressive way that actually reflects the radical egalitarianism of Jesus. Let's jump in. If you live in the United States, it's pretty easy to make the assumption that Christianity has always been a conservative thing. But has it really? You might be surprised to learn that no, it's only been since the 80s that Christianity has been so strongly associated with conservatism. At its inception, and among the first people to practice Christianity, the teachings of Jesus were interpreted and implemented in a pretty socialist way. The early church and Christian founding figures like Basil of Caesarea and John Chrysostom lived according to what we would now consider socialist principles. The common ownership of property, the community providing for the needy, and criticism of those who hoarded wealth from labor. Several accounts from the time describe Christian social systems as not being founded on ruthless competition, the privatization of the means of production, nor on the veneration of greed that capitalism is characterized by today but rather on the same values we find in leftist literature. Over time, Christianity spread and diversified, often in more politically varied ways. Still, many groups continued to espouse an egalitarian conception of community and development, with leftist Christian groups existing throughout the world and eventually appearing in America alongside the more well-known proto-capitalist Calvinists. Calvinists aside, American Christianity often took on a progressive character, most famously, the early 20th century saw movements like the social gospel bringing progressive religion to the forefront of American life. In 1917, Walter Rauschenbusch, a central figure in the social gospel, published a manuscript for the new religious movement, in which he rips apart capitalist exploitation of labor, their responsibility for imperialism, colonialism, war, political autocracy, and economic content. oligarchy, all through well. the lens of Passport Christianity. Is. Christian ethics, Rauschenbusch argued, were completely incompatible with those of capitalism. This, in turn, launched a movement of broad-spanning social justice that came to influence American politics the nation over. His work deeply shaped the American conception of religious morality, in everything from the New Deal to the Civil Rights Movement and the central role played in it by Baptist minister Martin Luther King Jr. Though he appears a little later in this story, MLK represents one of the most clear-cut examples of people whose religiosity worked in tandem with their leftist politics. As we just mentioned, MLK was a Baptist minister. 
He spent years studying Christian theology, worked in the church, and eventually became a leading figure in Christian society, and in American society more broadly. It was in the church that he couldn't reconcile the deep inequality of a capitalist society, which stranded millions of Americans in poverty, with the morals of the Christian church, catalyzing speeches like this. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society when machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will be only an initial act. One day we must... Oh, what a fucking tanky, dude. Ew. Ew, why is, Hasan why is Hasanabe platforming yet another fucking tanky, dude? I learned about Seven this months, term. So thank you. Okay, Sam. so I'm just going to say it all the fucking time. Ew. It's come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. So, what happened? When did Christianity suddenly become synonymous with conservatism? Let's go back to the 1920s. For starters, higher criticism, sometimes called historical criticism, began gaining traction in German academic circles. This might seem obscure, but the movement rapidly spread. Higher criticism was centered on questioning the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible as a singular text. Scholars started asking more profound questions about the Bible, like when was it written, by whom, and how soon after the events that it relates. The answers were not always in line with what Christians had been hearing at church. Essentially, these were the kinds of questions that started creating fissures among Protestants between those who saw the Bible as infallible and rejected any critique or critical observation of its nature, and those who integrated emerging science into their faith. This split manifested all over the Christian world, particularly as Darwin's theory of evolution began being taught in public schools. It all came to a head in what became known as the Scopes Monkey Trial. In this historic legal case, high school teacher John T. Scopes was accused by the state of Tennessee of teaching the theory of evolution, thereby denying the biblical origins of man in a public school classroom, something which the state had outlawed earlier that year in 1925. This case blew up, attracting attention from media all over the country in what became the battle between fundamentalist Christians, who held on to creationism, and modernist Christians, who integrated scientific progress into their faith. Scopes lost the case, but it didn't matter. The schism between the progressive, mainline Protestants and the conservative, white evangelical Protestants was complete. Most importantly, the trial pushed conservative evangelicals into mass media. Up to that point, conservative Christians largely saw themselves as losing the war of hearts and minds, with progressive policies and progressive Christians alike growing in number and influence around the country. The trial showed them it didn't have to be that way they could increase their influence beyond the physical walls of the church. Enter Amy Semple McPherson and her conservative Christian media. Born in October 1890, McPherson got her first exposure to Christian fame when she publicly questioned the validity of evolution as a high schooler. This public gesture garnered the attention of her native Canada and its burgeoning anti-evolution movement, setting her along a pretty unique path for her time, conservative Christian celebrity. Not long after her first brush with fame, McPherson began evangelizing and eventually moved to Los Angeles. There, among the Hollywood crowd, McPherson tapped into her power as a charismatic speaker and soon after into the growing power of radio. McPherson chained together sermons with magazines, plays, and most importantly, radio shows. 
garnering massive audiences in Hollywood and around the country. It's hard to overstate the power that McPherson's oh, sermons yeah, had on conservative right Christianity. Not only did she practically create the concept of televangelism, her fame simultaneously brought about the first American megachurch, bringing in tens of thousands to a new era of Christianity, all the while knotting together conservatism with the more typically progressive faith. This was very apparent in McPherson's sermons, in which she often painted an America under attack by foreign forces, immigration, evolution, and, most terrifying of all, the growing atheistic, godless communist movement taking root domestically and abroad. In McPherson's sermons, the United States was enshrined as the last bastion of faith on the planet, and it was the duty of American Christians to defend their faith against the spread of what they perceived to be an amoral system of belief not founded on the word of God. Specifically, McPherson warned her audience of what she believed to be the ultimate goal of communism, overthrowing the US government and, in the process, destroying its supposed Christian roots. The United States, she believed, had been uniquely blessed by God for its Protestant piety, for which it had been rewarded with prosperity and relative domestic peace. A communist attack would upend this blessing. And so, McPherson desperately fought to ensure it would never come to America. Around this time, American patriotism became firmly entangled with Christianity, with evangelists in McPherson's circle saying that acts like refusing to salute the American flag were not only unpatriotic, but also somehow unchristian. Immigration, too, became tangled in this imagery. Older, whiter, more Protestant immigrants were seen as good and assimilated into the fabric of the United States, whereas the new, non-white, oftentimes Jewish immigrants brought with them anti-American and anti-Christian communist and atheist values. All the way back in the 1940s, McPherson's sermons sounded exactly like the Trumpist rhetoric we see today. In a speech that crystallized this new era where patriotism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, conservatism, and Christianity merged, McPherson said, If they do not like our Constitution, if they do not like the Bible of America, and the fact that this is a Christian nation born and steeped in Christianity, we can escort them to the waters and say, Goodbye, go back to your own land. No hard feelings, but we won't have you here. At this point, the story is picked up by several other charismatic Christians. Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, Pat Robertson, and Jerry Falwell are some of the most well-known examples of people who grew up on the McPherson brand of Christianity and used a new medium, television, to carry the message of Christian nationalism even further into the 20th century, cementing the role of televangelism in the American landscape. At this point, and as with many topics in American history, it's impossible to avoid the impact of the Cold War and the Reagan years. In 1979, just one year before Reagan was elected, Jerry Falwell... Bro, this is literally his greatest video. I'm not even kidding. This is like, this might be Second Thought's best video of, of all time. It's so well done. It's so well written. It's so fucking good, dude. By the way, um, I'm sure that the, I haven't been looking at the chat. I've been watching the video, but I haven't obviously been here. Um, robot loop is what I'm cooking while simultaneously watching so that people don't freak the fuck out. But, um, as they often do. The reason why I, <clears throat> what I was going to say is like, I'm sure there are probably chatters in here like, uh, you know, Reddit atheists who are fucking losing their minds. But this is basically what I talk about regularly uh, with respect to like the history of of liberation theology and like radical uh, with ecumenical Marxists and like how fucking socialist the religion can be because it's a weapon. Okay, that's all it is. It is ideology. Um. Anyway, these guys are some of the biggest scumbags on the planet. I don't know what else to say about it. Just one of the most watching. influential televangelists created the Moral Majority. We'll get to what that is in a second. Big Around this time, Robert. evangelicals started growing in socioeconomic power and, that, most importantly for Republicans, voting power. Evangelical oh, churches grew, as did the fortunes of their members, until eventually, evangelicals made up a third of the American adult population. Rallied around the speeches of massively popular televangelists, evangelicals began to see their involvement in politics as a divine necessity. But voting for conservatives and leading single-issue campaigns began to look small compared to the power evangelicals were beginning to amass. 
prompting Robertson, another famous televangelist, to announce in 1979 that, We have, together with the Protestants and the Catholics, enough votes to run the country. And when yes. the people say, we've had enough, we are going to take over. And so, Falwell created the Moral Majority, a political group that would exchange an enormous voting bloc for a comprehensive evangelical program in the Republican Party. As and I are. wonder if it'll show one of my favorite fucking videos from the Moral Majority's other founder, not just Falwell, but uh, what's his face? Uh, the other founder who uh, very famously said, you, you know, are. a lot of you Christians have goo-goo government syndrome. You guys know what I'm talking about? A lot of a lot of you Christians have goo goo government syndrome. Paul Weyrich is the person that I'm thinking of. Uh, yes. You want the government? You want everybody to go out and vote? That's like we don't yeah. want everyone to go out and vote. That's how we lose power. Now, evangelicals felt confident that they could dictate party policies to Republican politicians on abortion, gay rights, the Equal Rights Amendment, and a host of social programs and foreign policy stances. Evangelicals ran popular broadcast media channels, publishing houses, colleges, and thanks to these new political groups like the Moral Majority, they were increasingly represented and emboldened by federal government representatives. Even Okay, is he going to play that clip or not? If not, I'm going to show you this. It's like... Here's Paul Weyrich, the founding father of the conservative movement, addressing a similar religious right gathering held in Dallas in the fall of 1980. This was also attended by Ronald Reagan, by the way. Now, many of our Christians have what I call the goo-goo syndrome good government they want everybody to vote i don't want everybody to vote elections are not won by a majority of people they never have been from the beginning of our country and they are not shut the fuck up to the people who are saying bro you show us this video every week okay suck my dick okay one you are so fortunate that you have been able to find a fucking content creator that routinely educates you on these issues that you have never fucking heard of before Okay, and then can you imagine literally getting to the point where you're like, well, I just found out about this from this show and I don't want anyone else to fucking find out about it. Like, well, well, shut up. Just shut up. Shut up and appreciate that now you can be a fucking a dickhead in the chat and be like, I've literally seen this already. Okay. There are thousands in here who have never seen this and it's important for them to understand that like, Virtually all of this fucking evangelical Christianity shit was a total fucking ploy and also shows what the Republican Party's motivations are. A lot of you in the chat have what I like to call the goo goo gaga I'm a nine month subscriber syndrome. Okay? Where you come in here for a, a, a couple months and you learn a lot of stuff and then you think like, well, I've already internalized all the lessons here so no one else can learn for the first time ever. That's right, dude. Fucking chill out. Not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Jerry Falwell and Ronald Reagan were also at that. And also, uh, Weirich uh, went to co-found the Heritage Foundation alongside Moral Majority, Free Congress Foundation, the ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council, and continues to host weekly strategy sessions for right-wing leaders. A profoundly important right-wing demon right here okay evangelical leaders were in congressmen's houses in the mailing lists of tens of thousands of americans and were suddenly a sizable lobbying group they had achieved political relevance like no other group in the united states later in 1979 evangelicals turned on their accrued power in full force backing the candidate that stood alongside them in every key issue Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. I won't spend too long on the results since you probably already know about them, but the evangelical-backed Reagan presidency gave rise to privatization, tax cuts for the wealthy, massive increases in military spending, environmental deregulation, pro-segregation politics, the disastrous the war on drugs, the horrific response to the AIDS epidemic, and the total halt on progress for LGBTQ rights at the national level. 
Many today credit the conservative discourse surrounding abortion, homosexuality, and the demonization of people addicted to drugs to these Reagan-era politics and the central influence of early conservative evangelicals. During this same time period, mainline, progressive, and leftist Christians saw- They literally destroyed America internally. The greatest terrorists of all time. 10 months, and I like, appreciate the lessons. Keep killing it, King. Osama bin Laden? Could never imagine having even a fraction of the fucking success that Republicans have had in the death and total destruction of American hegemonic power. It's a slow and very painful crippling uh, towards our inevitable demise. And we are hurting so many people as a consequence of that. But goddamn, dude, we are literally... Republicans are the greatest terrorists, dude. They are so successful. Saw declining numbers all over the country. The cumulative effects of the Red Scare, the Cold War, and a community with a less narrowly defined identity, and thus a more loosely held together community, meant that the Christian left became more and more obscured in politics and society as a whole. I, this is something I don't really talk about that often, but I, I should probably bring this up every now and then. I'm sure many of you probably from time to time wonder like why I don't fucking shit on tankies or why uh, like despite me making fun of uh, anarchists and shit and even you know uh, dengus and stuff like that or dumbass like ultras or whatever the fuck people are calling them now. Red scary. The reason why I believe in a broad leftist coalition is because I think the Overton window is unfortunately way too fucking slanted towards fascist reactionary right-wing politics so i don't mind having fucking uh people who are dumbasses who are on the left that are even if they're like some of the most unhinged psychos i don't mind that like they have a voice at the fucking table to a certain degree that ultimately makes people like myself look more normal in comparison that's the way i see it that's the reason why i don't fucking spend a lot of time on people like that now, the only, and also because I think that a, a united left has similar goals, especially in the fucking short term. Now, having said that, however, the second reason, which I also think is uh, incredibly important, is because there, there's no power. They're powerless. Like, if there were fucking, you know, I guess, Stalinists in the American government, like, I mean, it's like a laughable idea. It's like, it's like thinking about, like, black separatists and, like, spending time on on black supremacist movements and black israelite movements and like criticizing them like why the fuck would i do that like they have nothing they have no power just laugh at them and move on you understand like it is it is it's such an exercise in futility unless you are trying to signal to the right people that uh you know you are uh you know you're shitting on black people too come on like there is virtually no reason unless you're fascinated by black israelites and black segregationists months, and, and shit like that unless you find that fascinating and you want to like you know watch it and stuff like that which is part of the reason why i don't even do that on stream a lot of times because i don't want to be in black people's business because i do think that like some white people will uh you know take wrong lessons out of that but the reason why I don't cover shit like that or the reason why I don't like spend a profound amount of time on shit like that is because they're powerless. They do not constitute a fucking threat. Black separatists do not constitute a threat to uh to, to like American organization. Okay, now justify your vile attack on vegans. Uh, you're annoying. That's it. It's just purely out of uh, entertainment. leaving an open field for evangelicals and conservative Christians in which to dominate the American political game. Fast forward a bit, and although Bill Clinton's victory represented a small setback for the evangelical movement, the ensuing presidencies of George W. Bush and eventually Donald Trump proved that a mobilized, motivated, and united electorate could importantly sway elections in favor of conservative candidates with highly religious social policies and talking points. 
Now, white conservative evangelicals are firmly settled in the American political landscape and exert tremendous power on the policies and posturing so from the Republicans we see today. That brings us to the present. Over 46% of Americans are Protestant, and more broadly... Someone in the chat said, in AOC, stock Dems do? No, they don't. I mean, they have a lot more power than, like, the average crusty anarchist or the fucking Maoist or whatever. But yes, social Democrats do wield a tremendous amount of power in comparison to fucking um, every, like, uh, every, every Marxist-Leninist. Like, what do you mean? Yes. They literally do. Which is why it's important to utilize people who are social democrats for um, at least like some kind of legitimate harm reduction when there is an when when you can. Second thought associates with Marcus Leninist, he is probably one as well, just not vocal about it, by the way, not saying this is a bad thing. I don't oh, <clears throat> I mean I associate with Marcus Leninist. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like I've had I don't want to anarchist the mob, but I've had more Marxist Leninist speakers, thinkers, organizers on this broadcast than I have anarchists. So some 70% of Americans identify as Christian. Republicans rapidly go about? after the evangelical vote, a group that today makes up about one in four Americans, but is overrepresented in elections, accounting for between 30 and 40% of the vote in 2020. In the last two presidential elections, a whopping 75 to 80% of that white evangelical vote went to Donald Trump. So, what do things look like on the left? For starters, the Christian left is seeing somewhat of a revival. Christian leftist organizations like Christians for Socialism and the Institute for Christian Socialism have gained popularity in the wake of the Trump presidency as socialism as a whole trends upward. It is also impossible to ignore the democratic base of black Christian voters who regularly ensure democratic victories and stand in stark contrast with the white evangelical vote. On the international stage, political parties on the left frequently embrace a Christian tradition in harmony with leftist or otherwise progressive politics. In many cases, Christian groups have defended progressive legislation here in the states. Like in 2014, when the United Church of Christ sued the state of North Carolina to defend same-sex marriage on the grounds of religious freedom. It's important to understand that the elected officials you see yelling the loudest about Christian morality are usually the worst representatives of the faith and often don't believe a word of it themselves. The most obvious example is Donald Trump, a man who, until launching his campaign for the presidency, did not make any attempt to pretend he was even remotely religious, and only adopted- Sorry. I just saw the dumbest fucking take I've ever seen. I don't know if you compare Marxism to anarchism, but anarchism is privileged shit. There's a reason why most of them are white westerners. Yeah, totally. All the white western anarchists in fucking uh, Bolivia, for example. Like, come on, dude. Like, I mean, I like clowning on anarchists too, but like, come on, dude. Like that's that's so that's such a like that's such an ignorant take, dude. Jesus Christ. Anyway, um, like. smile fuck that wasn't what i was gonna snipe though someone else literally said wow fascists wield more power than anarchists so let's fucking you know where is it some fucking dumbass in the chat was say, making it seem like i was i had ever said that we should uh we should be nicer to the fascists or something evangelical language to secure that large and vital Republican voting bloc. But Repu
Fascists have more power than anarchists. Let's cater to fascists politically. Hasanabi. Oh, this is the guy. Oh, he's the one who said it. Uh, oh, no. He's just repeating someone else, I think, in the chat. I don't know who fucking was the first person who said it. Oh, okay. Privilege cost the anarchist privilege to be stuck in the gutter. Yeah, dude, there are no such things as fucking privilege kick W moron. Privilege cost the anarchist kick W privilege to be stuck in the gutter. Sock them will save us, I'll promise. Democrats have more power than sock them, so we should just support the democratic platform. Full stop, Hepega. Dude, why are you like this, dude? Why are you like this? Like, what's wrong, dude? Just fucking just take a shower, okay? The one thing that anarchists fear the most, dude. Go take a shower, okay? Fucking owned. Republicans aren't the only ones at fault here. There are plenty of Democratic politicians who make a point of reminding people that they're Christians, despite very few, if any, elected officials fighting for legislation that would actually help the poor, the sick, the elderly, or any of the cast aside and forgotten groups that Jesus called his followers to care for. In fact, these politicians often ignore the will of the people when it comes to things like universal health care or ending homelessness, things that have overwhelming support and are clearly more in line with their supposed Christian values than the corporate handouts they so frequently produce. No matter who you are, religious or not, it's important to realize how a few key figures in the white American evangelical movement have taken a religion with a rich history of egalitarian values and convinced us that its only legitimate avenue in politics is through a platform that preaches hyper-individualism, greed, siding with massive corporations, and hatred of the poor. In spite of these efforts, plenty of people let their faith guide and supplement a socialist humanitarian conception of society. Many Christian or otherwise religious people today suffer under a capitalist system of exploitation and alienation, both domestically and abroad. Correcting this notion that capitalism is somehow the decree of a god who preaches justice is critical to our success. And this applies to every religion. I've interacted with countless socialists online and in person, and the Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, all the religious socialists have been among the most devoted to actually caring about improving the material realities of their fellow human beings. Regardless of what you think of religion as a whole, regardless of whether you consider yourself a religious person, we need to realize that the American version of Christianity has been co-opted and perverted for devious ends. The Christianity of modern-day white evangelicals bears no resemblance to the radical teachings of Jesus. If religious Americans truly want their faith to be a force for good, they must take their religion back from those who have turned it into a weapon of evil. Dude, there is so much that he could branch off to from this video, and I hope he covers this more. Like, this as a foundation is great. But if you were to describe, like, <clears throat> white Protestant evangelical Christianity and how it, like, became the most dangerous movement in America and perhaps the world, you can literally branch off to Zionism and how white evangelical Protestants uh, and their fucking religious scripture is the reason why they are the largest supporters and funders of of um, the Israeli apartheid state, like, like every part of that, every part of this movement is so like everything you fucking hate about America, you could tie back to rich fucks weaponizing the prosperity gospel and religion to gear up a bunch of fucking working class hogs and other uh, working class lumpen proles and other fucking petite bourgeois and, and just capital owners and business owners into becoming the most effective political group. Like, it is insane to me that they make up, like, what, at most 30% of the uh, entire voter base, and we cater to them. We cater to white evangelical Protestants like no other subgroup. They make up 30% of the voters 
And yet, in Texas, for example, we have destroyed Roe v. Wade for them. And perhaps Asshole. in the entirety of the United States. Despite the fact that 75% of the American public believes that Roe v. Wade should remain the law of the land. But because of evangelicals and how fucking psychotic they are and how powerful they are and how much voice, uh, how, how, how overwhelmingly uh, powerful their voices are, we'll just have to live with that reality. <laughs> 